Well, good morning, Walden Church. Hey, I wanted to show you some funny road signs. So signs you'd see while you're out driving, you tell me, do these make sense? Are they confusing? Or are you gonna think like me and say that they're a little bit funny? Okay, here's your first one. I don't understand this. Do, do they want us to drive towards each other? Some signs are confusing. Other signs seem totally unnecessary. Yes, we all see the big tree. Other signs and warnings seem like outright lies. This has gotta be fake, right? Because my first question is, where are they falling from? <laughs> this sign is obviously homemade and humorous, but it's helpful. I mean, if I saw that, I might actually do what it says. Accidents are prohibited on this road. I don't know how I can obey this. I mean, I, I will try, you know, if it, if it were up to me, yes, I will try. This one's just terrifying. This is worse than the cows. Is this some sort of a, an attack deer? Now, I'm sure signs are better in other countries. What would you do if you saw this while you were driving overseas? You know, Honey, do we have a sword? And here's my favorite one, please slow drively. I think the person who made this sign needs their own sign. Road signs should warn you, right? But they should give you a correct warning. They should prepare you. They shouldn't lie to you or confuse you. These signs should help. They should influence you, right? To drive correctly, prepare you for what's down the road. But some signs, if they're confusing or false, they can be more harmful than if they hadn't even existed, right? Because a false sign could look right and we could follow it, but it would lead us in the wrong direction. We're in a sermon series and we're gonna finish it up uh, here in a couple weeks and Jesus is winding down the Sermon on the Mount, and he's gonna close by saying, watch out for false signs. Watch out for false influences. Last week we talked about the broad path, and we said that the world often takes that path, and Jesus says, I want you to take the narrow path, the narrow road, the way of truth, the way of Jesus. And I believe that Jesus' teaching here on false prophets is strategically placed because he's just finished teaching about the broad way and the narrow way. And perhaps the reason why so many people take the broad path is because of all the teachings and their bad influences. And they're not new, following the wrong sign, listening to the wrong voice, it can be traced all the way back to the Old Testament. It seems as long as God has been telling his people the right way to go, there have always been people who are trying to convince all of us that there is a better, easier, cheaper option. God said that? Oh, well, you know what? Follow me, I got a better plan. We call them snake oil salesmen. Oil from Chinese water snakes has for centuries been used in Chinese traditional medicine to treat joint pain like arthritis. It has been suggested that the use of snake oil in the United States may have originated with the Chinese railway laborers in the mid 19th century. They worked long days, had experienced physical toil, and Chinese snake oil may have had real benefits back then. But the term snake oil over time became known and associated with this kind of cure-all, fix-all elixir for any kind of problem. And many of the 19th century entrepreneurs, they would advertise and they would sell mineral oil that didn't contain any snake. <laughs> and they would claim that this miracle elixir could cure anything. And snake oil is a term now that we use for deceptive marketing or 
a healthcare fraud or a scam. Similarly, snake oil salesman, that's an expression we used to describe somebody who sells or promotes some sort of fraudulent remedy. Jesus called them false prophets. In the Old Testament, we see many false prophets. And even though they're not labeled that way in the Old Testament, they're still guilty of the same thing. But they were men and women who used their influence to lead Israel in a false direction. They were a bad sign. And they led people away from God. In 1 Kings 18, Elijah, most famously, faced off against 800 of them at Mount Carmel. Then we see today, false prophets. Jim Jones, who led 900 people to a mass suicide in South America. David Koresh, who with over 80 followers died. Or Heaven's Gate, 39 members committed mass suicide by Marshall Applewhite looking to hitch a ride on the hale Bop Comet. Those are the worst ones, right? Those are the most popular. But anything, anything that would lead us away from God or preach the opposite of truth is a bad influence. False prophets don't have to look like prophets. They don't even have to look like people. Bad influences are everywhere. Zephaniah wrote of false prophets in Israel. He said, her princes within her are roaring lions. Her judges are evening wolves. They gnaw not the bones till morrow. Her prophets are light and treacherous persons. Jesus preaches his Sermon on the Mount specifically to reset all the bad beliefs that were floating around at the time. The Pharisees and the religious leaders, they were doing a poor job of pointing people to God. They were bad signs. And just like TV preachers sometimes today, they were trying to keep all the fame and money and glory for themselves. And Jesus pushed the reset button on their influence, and he warns the people, watch out. So I believe that this is very important, that we learn to recognize bad influences and false prophets. We need to call a spade a spade. When we see false truths being taught, we need to challenge those truths. We should not walk around with our hands in our pockets and say, well, no harm, no foul. Or, you know what, it's none of my business. False teaching is false teaching. And false prophets are enemies of God because they don't preach truth. Psalm 86 says, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. John 14 says, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And John 8 says, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. God is truth. Right? God is truth. Christ is truth. The Word of God is truth, and the truth sets us free. So, subsequently, an influence that pulls somebody in the opposite direction then is not from God. It's false. It's darkness. It's, it's demonic. So, I believe... It is just as wrong for people to hear a false prophet and do nothing as it is for a person to preach false testimony. First Thessalonians says, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. I don't care if it's lies on Facebook or YouTube or an email. If it's not true, it should not be posted, forwarded, or shared. And as Christians, it's our mandate to uphold truth. Just because it sounds true, or just because you think it looks like a reputable source, don't believe it or share it until you've done your homework to make sure that it's true. In 1 Corinthians 5, Paul reprimands the church. He says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not to rather mourn? 
Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Paul told the church that it was just as bad to sit around and say nothing about sin in the church as it was for the people who committed the sin. And he goes on to say in verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So we need to learn to recognize the false influences when we see them. Especially since Ephesians 4 says that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. Now, with the internet and cable television, there are so many influences today. Who do you listen to? How do you know what's true? Even in world religion, right? There are now so many ways to God. First John 4 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So today, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to talk about how to accurately size people up. How do we use discernment? When we are listening to truth, when we're listening to a teacher, when we're listening to a prophet, how can the church then model wisdom and maturity and not be easily rocked like a ship on the ocean? Jesus teaches in Matthew 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Notice the first thing that Jesus says about false prophets. He says, watch out, right? false prophets who come to you. Now, I'm sure nobody here <laughs> would go looking for a false prophet, but the reality is, according to Jesus, false prophets come looking for you. False prophets come looking for us. You don't have to go to them. Now they come to us. Hey, you have a new email. Based on the data that we've stolen from you, YouTube says, watch this video. It used to be, if you wanted trouble, you had to go looking for trouble. Now, trouble comes and finds you. Don't be embarrassed. It even happened to Jesus. Jesus tried to get away. He tried to have some time alone, tried to fast and pray, and what happened? Matthew 4 says, then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came to him. Bad influences come to you. They know where you live. Now, in the time of Jesus, a false prophet would walk into your town. They would prophesy, and they would physically be in the market. But in our day, false prophets have easier ways that come into our lives. They can weasel in through some media outlet. Jesus ends the Sermon on the Mount by saying, watch out for false prophets because they are coming to you. Radio, TV, music, movies, internet sites, newspapers, magazines, conspiracy theories, anywhere and everywhere. False prophets can even show up in celebrities, politics, and our schools. The second important thing is that Jesus says about false prophets is that they come to you in disguise. He says, don't look at their appearance, right? They're a wolf in sheep's clothing. That channel on YouTube that looks legitimate, looks like a real news station, but it's just a green screen and a desk. That TV preacher with his big smile, and he always wears an expensive suit. Can't possibly be wrong. I read it in a book. 
Songwriter Tom Waits, he said, most people don't care if you're telling them the truth or if you're telling them a lie, as long as they're entertained by it. Friends, the best lie is the one that's as close to the truth as possible. So how do you recognize the road sign? How do you tell the good influences from the bad? Thessalonians says test everything. First John says test the spirits to see if they are from God. And Jesus says there is even a fruit test. He says every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. So what are these tests? How do we tell the good fruit from the bad? Well, first, there's the Bible test. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. How do influences speak of the Bible? What are their teachings about the Bible? What are their teachings about Jesus? Are they trying to change the Bible? Are they trying to remove some verses? Are they ignoring some verses? What is their relationship with Scripture? How do they teach the Bible? Because Jesus says whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Are they relaxing the Bible? Relaxing is the Greek word lou, and lou means loosen. It means taking off your shoes. It means the separation that happens when you get a divorce or you dissolve a legal agreement or you break up something. It's pretty simple. If the Bible is the truth, then anything that is contradictory to the Bible is what? A lie. For instance, what happens when somebody goes on TV and claims, I'm Jesus, and the news reporters are interviewing him, trying to find out all about him. Really? You're Jesus. Do you need to panic and say, oh no, we missed it? How could I have not noticed this? There Jesus is on TV? No. You would just go to the Bible. In Matthew, Jesus says, For as the lightning comes from the east and shines as far as the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. And then, in Revelation, it says, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. The Bible doesn't say that when Jesus comes, he'll come secretly and he'll come to Australia, and he'll go on TV just to announce his return. And oh, by the way, his real name is John. When Jesus returns, how will we all know? We'll know because he's not coming secretly. The Bible says it'll be the most public event in history. The world says things like, well, Jesus was nice, and he was just a holy man, or you know, he was just a good, or he was just a moral teacher. Another false prophet might say that Jesus is the brother of Satan, just like the Mormon church teaches. That's contradictory to the Bible. The world says all kinds of things about Jesus that aren't true, while Scripture describes the truth about Jesus. The Scriptures say that he is God, that he died, that he was resurrected, and that one day he'll come back to judge the world and to take his people with him to live in heaven forever. So how do we recognize truth? To recognize truth, you need to know truth. You need to know the Christ of the scripture. You need to know the real thing in order to spot all the fakes. Make yourself an expert of the text. If you know the real thing, you will spot the fakes quickly. Second test is the love test. The love test. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. A little further down, he says, You have heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies 
and pray for those who persecute you. You know, people who are sweet on stage, but they're angry behind the scenes. People who have just as many enemies as they have friends. How a person shows love is a huge test of their character. I don't care how many speeches you give. I don't care how many books you write. If they don't show love, if their motives are purely selfish, if they're cost-driven or bottom-line-driven or they don't care who we step on driven, then they're not from God. How do those influences treat their friends? How do those influences treat their family? You just look at the people who know them. Look at the people who know them the best. Are they liked at work? What proves somebody's character more is who loves them. I don't care how many references you give. I don't care how many followers you have. What do their coworkers say? What do their family members say? You can sell a lot of snake oil, but you can't sell any to your family. You can fake out a lot of people, but not the people who really know you. In fact, what's the first fruit of the Spirit? Galatians says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, right? It's the first one. Third test, how they handle pressure. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where does this person keep their treasure? And what would they do when the floor falls out? P.G. Wodehouse says, to find a man's true character, play golf with him. A person who hopes in the Lord, then who experiences pressure, you would think they would first go to their knees. They say, you know what? Let's pray about this. Their hope is in eternity. But a false person, when life turns up the heat, they'll turn on their heel and walk away. When the screws are tightened, the person whose treasure is in heaven will look to heaven for help. And then lastly, there's the behavior test. And this is the one Jesus mentions here at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He says, if you want to test faith, then test faithfulness. In other words, what they do. Do they practice what they preach? How is the fruit that falls from the tree? Do their lives match up with what they're saying? And the test here that Jesus points out is, he says, a good tree can't produce bad fruit, which means good trees have to produce good behavior. And Jesus says, that's the test. By their fruit, you will know them. Whether by their fruit, Jesus means doctrine, or their behavior, or the way they show love, or at some point they'll go through some tests and you'll watch as they uh, slowly go through something that is crippling in their lives. This is what Jesus is talking about. He says they are wolves in sheep's clothing and that ultimately the truth will be revealed. This is what he means when he says you can recognize a tree by its fruit. How the person is on the inside is who they really are. Billy Graham says, when wealth is lost, nothing is lost. When health is lost, something is lost. And when character is lost, all is lost. This is what Jesus is saying. Who they are truly on the inside will inevitably come out. They have disguised themselves to look like something, perhaps something that would even help you. Someone who would come and pretend to be kind and gentle, a white knight, a guru, a savior, a friend. But Jesus says, inwardly, they are ravenous wolves. So they're not really coming to help you. Instead, they are coming, Jesus says, to hurt you. 
Notice Jesus compares false tr- prophets to wolves, but then also thorn bushes. Tell me something. When would a thorn bush hurt you? Thorn bushes and thistles hurt us when we let them. Thorn bushes and thistles can't hurt you if you don't touch them. They have to come in contact with you in order to hurt you. You have to believe what they're selling. You have to believe their lies in order for them to hurt you. You have to do what they tell you in order for them to hurt you. Well, surely not Christians, right? I mean, we won't be fooled. We won't follow a bad influence. We, we'll, we won't follow the wrong person. We'll know, right? Oh, sure, we'll know. In Mark 13, Jesus says, For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. Listen, a fruit tray may be beautiful, may be decorative, and it may even give lots of cool shade in the summertime. But still, its primary purpose is to bear fruit. And so it's only judged by what it produces. It's not judged by how it looks. When you can see what sort of person someone is, when they show themselves to be living a trustworthy life, then you can start to develop a trust in that person. Then, when they've passed the test, then you can allow them in as an influence or as a role model. But as Christians, we must learn to distinguish true from false, the sheep from the wolf. And we do that by digging deeper, looking closely, and determining what kind of fruit they are producing. We know the test for the good trees and the bad trees, the good people and the bad people, the good systems and the bad systems, and even then, sometimes, it's hard to tell. So God makes a final word. In verse 19, he says, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. That's pretty straightforward, right? If you ask me, if you have bad fruit, you won't last. God will remove them. Where is Jim Jones? Where is David Koresh? Has anyone heard from Reverend Moon lately? See, they may have fooled a lot of people, but they all flunked the God test. God won't allow his children to follow a shepherd that doesn't love his sheep. Jesus says, my sheep hear me and they know me and they go in and out and find good pasture because my sheep recognize my voice. You and I need to be stewards who recognize the truth and recognize the voice of our loving Savior. Take all the time that you can to get to know your Jesus, to get to know your loving Savior, to become acquainted with truth, so that the moment you see something that isn't true, you recognize it instantly. Not because you've learned to recognize falsehood, but because you've learned to recognize truth. You have a shepherd who loves you and who wants nothing more than to have a relationship with you. Spend time with Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, when we read verses like this, sometimes it can be scary because they begin with watch out and they're filled with warnings. And yet, your intention wasn't to scare us. Your intention was to love us. These verses should make us feel loved. These verses should make us aware that you are present in our lives and that you want nothing but the best for us and that you're looking out for us. 
as sheep, it's very easy for us to be distracted and to try to find our own way, to try to seek our own answers or to puff ourselves up and to think that we know what's right and what's best for us. Lord, may we be students of the word. May we learn to recognize your voice more and more each day. May your words bring us comfort. May they be the direction that we should follow. And ultimately, may they be the catalyst that drives us closer to you. We are yours. We are yours because you are truth and you are love. And when we are connected with you, we are connected to the vine. And the vine will always make sure that we bear good fruit. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your care. Amen. Hey, we're so glad to have you here this morning. We're so glad that you watch us. Um, just know that we're going to do this sermon series for a couple more weeks. And uh, then by the time school starts and the end of summer, we're actually going to discontinue having sermons online because we really want to encourage you to return to church. We want to encourage you to be a part of this family. Fellowship takes place when we gather together, and that is a crucial element to church. We miss you. We do. We miss you terribly, and we are so looking forward to your return. We hope that you have found these uh, sermons online helpful as we've gone through the pandemic, and we are looking forward to seeing you return. I love you guys. I'll see you next week. Bye.